This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. On today's program, we're going to ask perhaps the most important questions any person can ask themselves, which is, who am I? What is my purpose in life? And and what am I doing here on planet Earth in the first place? Those are the questions that I became absolutely obsessed with uh, from the time I was a very, very young child. Because I figured if I didn't know the answer to those questions, I mean, I'm talking about like seven, eight years old. If I didn't know the answer to those questions, like what was I doing here on planet Earth? Why am I alive? What is my purpose in life? If I didn't know those questions, then then life was meaningless. I mean, you know, why live? So I'm going to talk about some things. Um of a supernatural nature, of a logical, rational nature that dramatically changed the direction of my life. And some of you have heard me talk about bits and pieces of this. Some of you have heard me talk about it at length. But this is the kind of program that you really do need to send um, to people that need to hear it. And and let me tell you something. There's a lot of people that need to hear the message, Uh, not necessarily that I'm just talking about, but they need to hear the contents of this message because people have no clue. Look, your average person in America or any other nation in the world has no real clue as to why they're alive, what their purpose in life is, and what they're doing here on planet Earth. They, they have no clue. They just, you know, exist. They may exist uh, on a very prosperous level. They must, may, you know, subsist by, by, by struggling to stay alive. But all of life really is pointless and meaningless if you don't have the answer to those questions. So that was something that obsessed my mind as a young child. But I grew up in an atheistic, intellectual household in New York City. When I say intellectual, I'm not talking about a stuffy family. I'm talking about um, I was surrounded with parents who had friends that were like deep thinkers, writers, artists, musicians. And, And so, you know, when I was hanging out listening to them talk when I was a kid, um, they didn't have any answers, by the way, but they talked about all kinds of out-of-the-box subjects, which opened my mind to all kinds of possibilities, but I noticed that they never had the, the real answers, that with all their you know intellect and creativity and stuff like that, they, they didn't have those answers. And when I went to school, and this was a huge disappointment, when I went to school, public school, um, man, I, I was really disappointed that, because I was looking forward to, boy, how naive was I, I was looking forward to uh, going to school and learning the answer to life's most important questions, because after all, I thought in my naive and young mind, after all, what could be more important in terms of learning than to first uh, educate the student or teach the student uh, about the big questions like why are you alive, what is your purpose in life, and what are you doing here? I mean, nothing else, mathematics, English, whatever you want to talk about, science, it's absolutely worthless if you don't have the answer to those questions. So I assumed that they were going to teach me that or at least uh, lead me uh, in that direction. And, you know, because that's what I was like focused on. Uh, how could I be focused on anything else? You know, two plus two equal four. Okay, that's great. We got that. But the thing is, how could I be like immersed in that when I didn't even know why I was alive? See, that was important to me. I mean, really important. And so when I got to school, I was bitterly disappointed because they never talked about the meaning of life and why a person's alive and what their purpose is. I mean, not only did they not talk about it, you would have thought that those questions were the most extreme, out there, deviant 
forms of pornography because they were like totally censored from the, the educational atmosphere of school. I never heard my parents' friends discuss it in depth, uh, nor did I hear it discussed by my friends as a kid and their parents. It was like these questions were like like giant neon signs in my head and, and nobody ever brought it up. It was like the big taboo. You just don't go there. So I realized nobody was going to help me. And now I didn't have any exposure to uh, uh, the Christian church at all. I had some exposure to uh, 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 Catholicism because uh, as a public school student, my grandmother insisted to my atheistic parents that I should go to religious instruction at the local Catholic uh, school and church. Uh, you know, once a week, they would walk all the kids from the uh, grammar school like me who went to public school and you would get to like an hour and a half or two hours of religious instruction <clears throat> at the Catholic school. And uh, although they didn't present it very well, at least the Catholics brought up the subject uh, as to the meaning of life. And I'm very thankful to the Catholic Church for, for at least doing that. And they talked about Jesus Christ being the Savior and, and the Lord, and he was born of uh, a virgin, the Virgin Mary, and that there was a heaven and a hell, uh, which I don't know if the Catholic Church teaches that today. I have no idea. But it wasn't all that clear the way they presented it, but I'm thankful that at least they presented it. Now, I didn't receive it. Uh, I shouldn't say I didn't receive it because they did plant seeds in me that, that came to fruition uh, years later. Um, but I rejected what they were saying because, you know, the, the, the message that people are communicating and how they're com communicating it are, are intertwined. You can't separate the two. So as a, a child or a young man or, <clears throat> you know, or teenager or whatever, I couldn't separate the trappings of Catholicism uh, from uh, the parts of uh, their doctrine that was very biblical, I, but I couldn't separate the whole Catholic thing from that. So I was turned off because the bottom line, I was turned off by the robes. Some people love that, but I, I couldn't stand it. The robes, the, the rituals, you know, the, 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 I couldn't understand why priests couldn't get married, nuns couldn't get married. Uh, all, all this, uh, and again, I didn't have any Christian training. It just seems like they were they were presenting a whole lot of extra baggage <clears throat> that, to me, looked very uh, ar archaic, old fashioned, like something out of another century, you know. And so I rejected uh, what they were saying because I really didn't identify at all with the way they presented it. The last thing I wanted to do and I'm not trying to be offensive to people that are Catholics, but the last thing I wanted to do was to, to go into a confessional booth, which I did. <clears throat> and I'll be brutally honest with you. The priest would be giving like uh, the equivalent of a sermon to us young kids. And then we were encouraged to go into the confessional booth, which I think you had to do it, or you were strongly motivated to do it. So I would walk into the confessional booth, which was, I thought it was an odd thing anyway. It was this, it was this like antique wood and <clears throat> some kind of velvet red, I think it was velvet red thing that you knelt on. And you, this was bizarre to me. You know, there was a little sliding door and uh, you, the, the, the priest wouldn't look directly at you. He would look like a head and you would look kind of at him. And uh, I remember the first time I went to confession and I was told I had to do this, that in truthfulness, I could not remember. I mean, I knew that I had sinned that week, but I couldn't remember precisely what the sins were. And I'm not trying to be facetious. I really couldn't remember. I'm just, I mean, I'm sure I lied and did this, that, and the other <clears throat> because I did it all the time. So um, I, uh, I, 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 I couldn't say nothing to the priest. So I actually had to lie to make up what my sins were. I mean, I know that sounds ridiculous, but that's what I did. So I lied to the priest. I said, you know, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. 
I've lied four times, or I was uh, disrespectful to my mother, or, and, and so it was all a lie. It doesn't mean I didn't do those things, but the, the amount of time that I did them, or did I do those sins, or some other things, I couldn't remember. So I had to lie about my sins, and so to cover my lie about my sins, I added an extra lie at the end, and, and, and Father, forgive me for all of my lies. Uh, and, and in my mind, I was including the lie that I just told about making up my sins. <clears throat> and so then he told me to uh, go to one of the pews and say five Hail Marys or whatever. And, you know, I, I did that. And, and while I was saying Hail Marys and holding the rosary beads, I really couldn't figure out what the purpose was of uh, repeating this prayer over and over again. Uh, you know, I, I can look back now and kind of figure out what the purpose was, but I couldn't then. Um, so anyway, I was turned off by the packaging. I know that sounds dumb, but, but that's really what it was. I was turned off by the presentation. Uh, I, could, I couldn't see myself doing that. I couldn't see myself becoming that. So I, I and then when I did see uh, people going to like Protestant churches uh, or uh, Protestant Christian churches uh, in uh, Queens and in New York City. Um, I, I just recalled looking at the, in the faces of the people that attended the church as I would be walking on my way to the subway or whatever to go into Manhattan or to do something on a Sunday morning. I would see the uh, people going into Christian churches, Protestant churches. And I, I would really like study them, and uh, um, I was turned off by what I saw because although I knew next to nothing about Christianity, I had heard that Jesus performed miracles, he resurrected from the dead, and stuff like that. So I assumed if if Jesus was this phenomenal and he who was this miraculous, there would have there would have had to be some kind of evidence of that in the lives of ordinary Christians like these Protestants and Catholics. And, and just through physical uh, uh, observation, I didn't see the joy on their faces. I mean, I don't know what, you know what that's supposed to be, but I didn't see any reality in their faith. In other words, I, all these great claims that were made about Jesus Christ, but here were the followers of Jesus Christ, and there was no evidence in their lives and their uh, attitudes and everything else. Uh, there was no evidence that... that, that uh, they really did serve or worship Jesus Christ, the God of miracles, the God who resurrected from the dead. So I, I rejected uh, Protestant Christianity and Catholic Christianity based on what the people did, because there was no reality of Christ's uh, miraculous resurrection or anything else in their lives. And so I actually despised them, despised them. I, in fact, I despised them so much, and this was my problem, really not theirs, I despised them so much that when I would walk, uh, I wouldn't do this all the time, but I did it once or twice. I was walking towards the subway, looking at all these people, a Protestant church, going into a Protestant church. And not I didn't do this in front of anybody. And I didn't do it in an area where anybody could see because I didn't want to be dis disrespectful and you know gross. But I just kind of like spit in defiance on the ground when nobody was looking. As, as my way of silently protesting my disgust with, with whatever they were, were into, which was, you know, again, my problem. It was judgmental on my part and many other things. But that's how deeply I hated Christianity. Because if you had to uh, compose a list of like 25 religions, Christianity, for me, uh, would have been at the bottom of the list. I just did not relate to it. Um, so I began, a, and since the school and since my exposure to church and, uh, uh, asking people questions, since I couldn't find the answers to, um, life's most three, most important questions, I began to look for it by myself. And so I got deeply involved at a very young age, studying all the great scientists, reading all their biographies hoping I would find the meaning to life in their books, reading all the books on psychology I could, I could uh, you know, reading books on the New Age and Edgar Cayce and Nostradamus and all kinds of things, meditation, uh, all kinds of things, some occult books, uh, 
Uh, and then, you know, I, I couldn't find the answers anywhere. And I was very frustrated because nobody would talk about them. And I was sure somewhere out there, there had to be answers to life. Now, um, I, I was like, you know, a big reader and stuff. And you've heard me talk about the fact that I was obsessed with reading and studying uh, George Orwell's 1984 and Alice Huxley's Brave New World about dark utopian societies. And then um, um, I couldn't find the answer in all these uh, scientists' uh, biographies either. So it told me that the great scientists didn't know the answers to these questions, So, which made me even more frustrated. So then I began to practice some of the techniques that I had read about in uh, some of the books by Edgar Casey and others, which were involved with, you know, the paranormal and ESP and meditation and stuff like that. And I really tried to practice a lot of uh, Edgar Cayce's uh, spiritual exercises. And um, by doing that, I didn't find the answers, but I believe that in, in retrospect, I did open portals or doorways into the occult spiritual realm, uh, which was not a good thing. And I didn't, I didn't, you know, I didn't see or experience anything that I can recall that happened as the direct result of it, but I think it did, but I just didn't see it. So then I began to read, after I read uh, Huxley's book, uh, Brave New World, I read his other book uh, called Heaven and Hell and the Doors of Perception. And in that book, which was a bestseller at the time, uh, he said that if you ingested the psychedelic drug mescaline, that it would uh, um, open the doors of your perception in your mind and you would find the answers to ultimate reality. Uh, he essentially said you would find the answers to what you were looking for. So since he was a highly respected author and he, and he wrote his book in a scientific way and uh, I um, said to myself, okay, I need to, to get a hold of this uh, psychedelic drug mescaline and experiment with it. I already had, had joined the you know, hippie thing and the counterculture as, as at a really, really young age, like, I don't know, 14 years old or something. So smoking marijuana and stuff like that I was already doing. But I read his book and I decided I was going to take mescaline not to get high, but as part of a personal scientific experiment where hopefully the doors of perception would open and I would be able to find the answer to life's most important questions. So uh, this now was high school, and I talked to a friend of mine whose father was a medical doctor, and uh, my friend uh, was an honor student, and I told him of what my plan was for the scientific experiment, and I don't know how he got a hold of it, he didn't get a hold of it from his father, as, as far as I know. But um, he got a hold of mescaline for me. So I took the mescaline, and, you know, I experienced its, its effects. It was not as powerful as LSD, but I experienced its effects. And, its, and you know, I, I, I sensed a, a, a mystical uh, reality was there, you know, beyond the senses. But, but my questions weren't answered. So I continued on reading this type of material, you know, reading books that talked about this in detail, altered states of consciousness. And then as a young boy in high school, I would see Dr. Timothy Leary, who, who I found out later was working for the CIA uh, because the CIA was actually behind the mass distribution of LSD. And, and, and Leary would jokingly say all the time that he believed in central intelligence, ha, ha, ha you know, kind of referring to, you know, cosmic consciousness or something. But the reality was Leary was uh, uh, working for the CIA. And, uh, but he was a Harvard professor and he, he was used as a spokesperson uh, to get people to try LSD because, quote, he said and others said that if you take LSD, quote, it will expand your mind. It will increase your intelligence. Uh, that was like a complete lie, but but being uh, young and not uh, not discerning enough, I I didn't listen to to those remarks. 
And so I took it. I took LSD because I would, he would appear on all these giant national television network shows like Phil Donahue and others whose names some of you probably don't remember. And they were giant, you know, that Phil Donahue at that time was as big or far bigger than like the show Ellen today. And he would get up there, Timothy Leary, and tell people to turn on, tune in and drop out, take LSD and, and expand their consciousness. So I tried it and uh, it was a nightmare experience. Uh, every time I did LSD, it was rather nightmarish. But I thought again in my foolishness that I had, I must have had a lot of bad karma to burn off. Uh, and therefore, you know, I didn't take it a lot, a, lot, a whole bunch of times, but I took it a number of times. And, you know, it changed my awareness, but it didn't give me, there was no truth. Okay. So then I got involved in meditation, uh, uh, early forms of astral projection, communicating with spirit guides, uh, uh, yoga, and uh, all kinds of things, studying all kinds of books like Baba Ram Das, the uh, associate professor with uh, Timothy Leary at Harvard, uh, was a guy named Dr. Richard Alpert who changed his name to Baba Ram Das and got involved in heavy-duty Eastern uh, mystical meditation. And he wrote a book called Be Here Now, which was kind of like my Bible. And it was a book about, you know, meditation and stuff. So I was into that. And then, uh, <clears throat> then I went to the university. Then from New York, I went to the University of Missouri and uh, uh, had a dual major of filmmaking and psychology. And the field of psychology that I majored in was a brand new experimental field called Altered States of Consciousness. And uh, where we studied scientifically, you know, the New Age movement, LSD, and other things, and uh, uh, related teachings that had to do with the psychology of changing your consciousness and mysticism, meditation, and psychedelic drugs and stuff like that. So, um, and then I was also uh, majoring in filmmaking. So... Um, I wasn't getting the answers to any of the questions, um, you know, that I was pursuing. And I, you know, continued on in the, you know, heavy-duty partying lifestyle, you know, that I had began, begun in uh, high school and continued through college, okay? So the thing was, I still wasn't getting the answers to these questions. And I was, the frustration level was, was like increasing in me. <clears throat> and um, so what happened, there I was in the University of Missouri. Now, this is the Midwest. I, I was born there, Columbia, Missouri. But I couldn't figure out, I mean, it was like going through a time machine somewhat when I went there. But the hippie movement was, was exploding at the University of Missouri, as was, by the way, the Jesus movement. So people were smoking marijuana and taking drugs like crazy and and the Jesus people came in and uh, all kinds of things. And gurus would come and uh, lecture the students like Stefan Gaskin, who was the head of the farm commune, who took a exodus of uh, psychedelic buses from San Francisco, California, and was headed out to, to establish like, like a super commune. I think it was it exists. I think it still exists in, I think, Tennessee. I'm not sure. So anyway, I ended up talking to him on his psychedelic bus. And uh, what was weird is I'd read all of his books because he was heavily into meditation and all kinds of psychic experiments. So I arrived at the campus where he was going to lecture like an hour and a half earlier than the event uh, occurred. And so I saw his buses pull up and all the members of his commune pull up, you know, they all have really long hair and purple robes and stuff like that. And so I introduced myself to Stefan, the guru, and, the, you know, he had this, like, powerful presence about him. And then uh, I uh, went aboard one of the buses uh, based on his invitation. And the first thing I noticed is that everybody on the bus looked depressed out of their minds. They looked miserable. And they had, you know, jars stored away of organic foods and they were probably smoking dope or whatever because they believed it was a uh, like a sacrament 
to, to, to alter your consciousness. And so, again, reality, I'm looking at people who are supposedly enlightened, who have uh, experienced cosmic consciousness, and uh, they look miserable. So the evidence of the reality, uh, I, I was uh, not, not like, I didn't become a believer, let's just put it that way. But I decided to come back and hear his lecture. But I was, there was a turmoil in me before I did that. A, a turmoil I had never experienced before. It was like um, there was something in me that felt that something was warning me, like, like some, some kind of inner warning that I was to stay away from this guy and not go to the event. It was like an inner warning. I hadn't experienced that before. And so I went anyway, and I listened to the lecture. And then at the end of the lecture, the place was packed with about 500 or 800 or 1,000 students. Um, I walked up to Stefan and began talking to him. And he looked into my eyes, and it felt like it wasn't, but it felt like some kind of telepathic experience. Because as I was looking into his eyes, it was like these electrical fingers were, were like trying to probe my mind. That's the only way I can describe it. But I understood uh, that, that I could just, I had the will to just lock it shut. Because I felt it was dangerous. And, and I talked to him and I said, you know, something to the effect of that, uh, you know, you, you, what you're talking about is really... Uh, uh, interesting, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and, but I said to him, but um, there's something deep within me that doesn't uh, fully trust uh, what you're doing, which was rather direct. And uh, he acted all serene like gurus are supposed to do. And then he said, well, we'll meet again. Well, thank God we never did meet again. So anyway, um, by this time I had experienced cosmic consciousness. I I had uh, had a lot of uh, mystical experiences happen in my life. So anyway, I, I still didn't find the answer. Uh, so finally, people from the Jesus movement came and began uh, talking to me about Jesus Christ as, as you know, the Savior, etc. And about that time, there was like a, time, a cover of Time or Newsweek that said the Jesus movement. And my initial reaction when I... Uh, uh, saw the cover of the magazine about the Jesus movement was like, I was like furious because I said these these people that are becoming Jesus freaks are are regressing, um, you know, and and there won't be a revolution because I believed in a revolution, not a guns and and violent revolution. I believed, ironically, based it was the complete contradiction of what I believed then and and what I write about and talk about now. Because back then, I, I believed in things that I absolutely don't believe in now. But back then, I believed that we could unite the planet, have like a one world go government. I was not into guns or bombs or anything like that. And we could unite the world in, in a kind of love based on higher consciousness. So, so the revolution would be a revolution of higher consciousness and love. That somehow, if mankind evolved into a higher state of consciousness all our problems would be solved. I mean, it sounds great. It sounds very utopian, but also very naive. So, um, but that's what I believed in. And uh, so I remember my first encounter with, with two of these born-again Christians. And I can't recall, to my knowledge, really ever meeting uh, a born-again Christian before. Well, there I was in the campus of the university, and there were these two girls in, I was taking a debate class, and there was two girls in the debate class who, um, you know, were always uh, debating, uh, even if it was, it was kind of a free-for-all debate class, where you took turns, excuse me, you took turns to, uh, you know, having a debate on something that you believe powerfully in. Well, these girls believe strongly in Christianity and that Jesus Christ was God. So, you know, when they made their presentation, you were allowed to, uh, to debate them on it. And so when they began to uh, uh, put forth the argument that Jesus Christ was God and uh, uh, that he was Lord and uh, stuff like that, 
I uh, immediately, uh, you know, raised my hand and, and, and took the opposite position. And sadly to say, um, um, I demolished them in a number of debates over several class sessions where they were reduced to tears. And I, you know, I feel bad about that looking back. Uh, looking back at it, I feel I feel bad about it, but I reduced them to tears. And the, but the reason they were reduced to tears is because even though now looking back, I understand what they were saying. They didn't have any. They didn't do any studying. They didn't do, ha- have any background. They didn't have any intellectual or rational or logical argument to support what they believed. You see, they, all they had was an experience. I got to say that I know Jesus is Lord. But that, that does, that's not enough in a debate class because I would ask them all these, you know, questions, which there are answers to, like, you know, how can a loving God allow all these evil things? And the, the standard questions that people uh, ask all the time about Christianity. So, um, um, anyway, they didn't have the answers, and they were frustrated. But that because they weren't prepared. I mean, it's a debate class; you're supposed to be prepared. So anyway, they ended up being reduced to tears, and I felt bad about that. But I said to myself, it only confirmed the fact that I thought you know Christianity is completely irrational. In fact, my parents taught me that Christianity was a religion for losers, and that Christianity was anti-joy. Uh, anti-sex, anti-intellectual, and the only people who believed in Christian uh, in Christianity were like you know Baptist ministers, ministers in the South who uh, who wore uh, dark suits and said Hallelujah as they were baptizing people in 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 the river. I mean, I know that's sarcastic, but that was really my image of what a born again Christian was. So um, this continued and. Uh, God, now I look back and I realize it was God. God began to to uh, arrange these uh, divine appointments or divine encounters at the University of Missouri. But remember, at that time I had hair down to my waist, smoking two packs of cigarettes a day, taking drugs, partying, the whole thing, reading, making films, and stuff like that. So uh, I was very rebellious, and uh, but... God set up some appointments for me, I mean, which I can, looking back, I consider to be miracles because they were just so outrageously unexpected. And I'm going to share some of them uh, with you in a moment. That when you hear them, they're they're just like so bizarre. There's no there's no way that these things could have just happened uh, by random chance. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. You're listening to the. Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. By the way, you can send a link of this program because I believe this program will answer people's questions. I believe that will give them a a logical presentation of the truth of Jesus Christ to people that are cynical and who have rejected it. And it will also build the faith of people that hear it. And you can send a link of this specific program. I I ask that you do to people that need to hear it. And you simply go to paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. And we have a whole list of social media apps on the uh, uh, right-hand side. Uh, iTunes, YouTube, uh, RSS, Blueberry, and a whole bunch of other social media apps. So you can play it on any kind of technology you want and send it to somebody anywhere in the world. Also, you'll see uh, an announcement soon of the next Paradise Mountain Church uh, local meeting. You'll see uh, some updates coming up soon on my conference schedule. I'll be speaking at the Red River Bible Prophecy Conference in Moorhead, Minnesota, uh, towards the end of March. And uh, it'd be great to uh, see you there. The conference is free, by the way, and also free live streaming. So you want to make sure you, you find out about that conference you can watch it anywhere in the world, and you can come to it. And um, the other thing is that uh, there's f- tons of free articles, tons of free YouTubes, and the archives of all these shows. And if you want to help us communicate the kinds of messages that you're hearing on today's program, 
all over the world, you can do that by making a donation or a contribution. And again, as always, I ask that uh, people would take on the spiritual assignment to become regular prayer partners uh, with this ministry and pray for us in intercessory prayer, because without prayer, nothing happens. So go to paulmcguire.us and do what God puts on your heart. And if a name or a person comes to you regarding this message, then send it to him. Uh, with a brief explanation by going to paulmcguire.us. Okay, so at the University of Missouri, uh, my everything is, is is escalating to a conflict. I did I am I have no idea that it's escalating to a conflict, but there's a spiritual conflict going on in my life between the forces of good and the forces of evil, and uh, I didn't know that at the time. So this is what happens: one of these strange events. Um. First year on campus, I lived in the dormitory. After the first year, I lived in different houses. But the first year, I lived in the dormitory. And I'm and the dormitory has the longest halls, just one long hall. I don't know. It's long. And so I start at one end of the dormitory. And it's just a, it's just a, it's just a narrow uh, hallway. It's, it's not a big hallway. It's a narrow hallway, and there's bedrooms on either side of the hallway. So I'm walking down the hallway, and as I get closer to my door, to my room, I see a guy sitting uh, uh, on the radiator. Obviously, the radiator is not on. Uh, <clears throat> and he has some little uh, small book he's looking at. And he, he, you know, I have long hair, and he has basically a crew cut. And uh, he, we talk, and he's here to meet somebody else. And he mentioned the name of the person. <clears throat> and uh, I indicated uh, where the person lived, and then I knocked on the door for him and said, you know, I don't think he's here. So then he tells me, you know, I was here to, uh, I had invited him to come to this meeting, uh, but since he's not here, you know, I, I'd like to invite you. Uh, uh, and he explained what the meeting was very briefly. Uh, and he said, well, we're having a uh, like a, something like a Christian retreat or something, or college Christian college retreat or something, you know, out in the country, uh, uh, outside of uh, the University of Missouri, you know, out in the country. And we're going to have a good time, and we're going to talk about Jesus Christ and, you know, the reasons why Jesus Christ is God and stuff. Well, that provoked my interest. But, but let me tell you something. 100% of the time, without exception, if somebody had come up to me, anybody, and invited me to a Christian religious retreat, I would have 100% of the time said flatly no. I wouldn't even considered it for a moment. Now, um, but there was something that I couldn't put my finger on about this guy. Now, it's not like I was like really focused in on it, but it was like a, a subconscious perception. This guy, like when I looked into his eyes, I could just see this like spiritual light emanating out of his eyes. And, 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 and there was something compelling about the light and the love that was coming out of his eyes because there was a purity in it that I'd never seen before. You know, and I think it's like semi-consciously I said to myself, that this is the first time I've ever seen a person who calls themselves a Christian who actually looks like a Christian. I'm saying this to myself, which, but by which I meant nothing about like the haircut or the choice of clothing. I meant this like supernatural glow coming from his eyes. It was like I'd never seen it before. I, well, I was seeing the light of Jesus Christ coming out of his eyes, but I didn't know that. And so, again, I normally would have said no. And, 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 I, and to this day, I can't tell you why I said, yes, I'll come. Because even with the, the, this 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 light pouring out of his eyes, um, I, I still wouldn't have said yes. So I, I can't tell you to this day why I said yes, I'll go. Because I think the retreat was that night or, or early the following morning. I can't remember, but it was like it, like it was like very soon after he invited me that night or the morning. And you know, he said we have arrangements. That Carl will take you there. Carl will take you back. So, uh, and plus, he looked 
physically, the way he dressed, uh, his haircut, you know, he, he looked like the exact opposite of a person that I would normally hang out with. So there was no natural reason that I would want to join him or anybody that looked and dressed like him anywhere. But again, for some mysterious reason, I said yes, which if you had known me, this was like incomprehensible why I would say yes. So I said yes, not knowing why I said yes. So I arrive at this, uh, what, it, what it is, it's a, it's a uh, Christian, uh, it was a Christian denominational retreat. You know, I wasn't big on like Christian vocabulary. I wasn't even sure what a denomination was. So uh, it was a Christian denominational retreat uh, about an hour outside of the campus of the University of Missouri, out there in the cornfields on a remote road, uh, kind of in the middle of nowhere. So, um, and, and, and they held uh, retreats and they invited the college youth to come, both the, the girls and the guys. So I get there, and there's a whole bunch of college girls and a whole bunch of college guys that are all there. And it was a fairly large group. I don't know, 100 people or something. And uh, uh, so I figure, you know, what I'm expecting in my mind is somebody can talk about the Bible and explain the Bible and explain why Jesus is God and, you know, the basic questions. Because I think in the back of my mind, I was still looking for who am I? What is my purpose in life? What am I doing here on planet Earth? I was looking for those answers. So, you know, basically what I saw was a bunch of guys flirting and joking with the girls. Okay, no big deal. I mean, that's normal. I don't I care less about that. But there was no spiritual talk. There was not even an extensive prayer. And that's why I had come. I mean, I, and, then, and then we met in a large room and where we were supposed to be discussing the faith and uh, reasons for the faith in Jesus Christ and answering questions. And what was happening is there was just frivolous talk, you know, like sorority uh, girl, soror uh, fraternity boy talk, you know, that kind of stuff. And giggling and laughing and stuff. Nothing's wrong with that, but I went, please, I didn't come out here in the middle of nowhere to listen to this. I'd rather go to a real party and party. So, um, and then, then uh, and this is this is what happened there. They were they were playing. They were playing. These are college students. They're playing spin the bottle. The girls and the guys are playing spin the bottle, and going off into the corners and making out. Now you got to remember, I grew up in New York City. When we partied, we partied. You know, I'm talking about hard partying and everything that went with it. Okay. And I did that in college. And the parties were wild, and they were out of control, and you can fill in the blanks. So here I am looking at, I feel like I'm in a time machine looking at a, living in a leave it to beaver uh, type twilight zone. Here I am with a bunch of leave it to beaver kids, college kids. And, and they're not talking. And when I, whenever I attempted, uh, obviously I didn't attempt to do it when they were kissing each other after spinning the bottle. But when there was time and a reason, I attempted to ask the other guys questions like, how do you know Jesus Christ is God? You know, because that was the purpose of the meeting. And, and I don't know, they'd say. And they'd be off, you know, flirting with some girl or whatever. They had no interest at all in, in, in Christianity. So I, I, it, it confirmed my worst suspicions of what I thought Christian, Christianity was. A country club type religion. Okay, so I decided I was going to hitchhike back to the campus of the University of Missouri. So uh, I slept over that night because it was dark. Got up in the morning, told the guy, uh, his name was Tim, who invited me. The guy that had the eyes that shined the light. I told him I was going to hitchhike back uh, to the University of Missouri, and I told him the reasons why. He apologized, said it's normally not like this or whatever. But I didn't even think about it. It was just like, that was it. The file was closed. But he did say this to me. He looked me in the eyes, and he had these eyes where, where, where I, it was like looking at Jesus in his eyes. i got to remember, I don't even believe in Jesus. But he's looking it's looking into his eyes. Is looking, it's like I can see Jesus in his eyes. And again, I don't even believe in Jesus. So, um, what happened next was he says to me, you know, Paul, 
God's going to take care of your rides home. Okay, so, you know, I was polite. I didn't say anything, but it was like my my inner thoughts were, yeah, yeah, sure, God's going to take care of my rides home. You know, I just I thought the guy was like crazy, like he was a religious fanatic, you know, a lunatic. But I was polite because he was a nice guy. So I stuck out my thumb on this uh, road in the middle of nowhere with with uh, cornfields all around us in this kind of field of dreams environment. And this road is there, okay? So I stick out my thumb on the road. And, and I, I hardly stuck out my thumb more than a minute. And, and a, a car pulls up, and it's a Pentecostal preacher and his wife in the car. Uh, they tell me that after I get in. And while they're driving me back to the campus, they're telling me about Jesus Christ, and and uh, they're they're giving me their testimony, and they're uh, telling me that I need to get saved. And and they were very loving, uh, a very loving couple. This pastor and his and his wife, and who were probably back then in their forties or fifties. I'd say they were there in their fifties. And so um, I thought that gee, that's an odd experience. And, but I said to myself, even though it was very odd and mysterious, I said to myself, you know, but after all, Paul, I'm saying this to myself, uh, you are in the middle of nowhere on, in the back roads of Missouri by the cornfields. And being that this is probably part of the Bible Belt, it's probably not all that unusual. I mean, it's not like you're in New York City taking the subway. It's probably not all that unusual for there to be, you know, like Christians driving down these roads. And so I stuck out my thumb again, and this time, again, it's about a minute goes by. I stuck, I stuck out my thumb. A station wagon pulls up, screeches to a halt. Uh, a guy wearing a dark three-piece suit and a tie says, um, where are you going? And I said, I'm going back to the University of Missouri. He says, okay, I'm going that way. Hop in. So I get into a station wagon. He begins to talk to me and uh, t- tells me, He's a Bible salesman, and uh, then he tells me that, that he's delivering and selling Bibles. And I look in the back of the station wagon, and I see boxes and Bibles everywhere. And they're all, you know, big, leather-bound, King James, thick Bibles uh, everywhere. So I believed, I wouldn't have believed he was a Bible salesman if I hadn't seen the Bibles everywhere. So, so anyway, he's, um, he grabs a hold of a Bible, big, thick, giant King James Bible, lets go of the steering wheel, or balance it as the steering wheel occasionally with his knee, as we're ripping down the highway, probably 65 miles an hour, which made me extremely nervous. And he's reading to me from the red letters in his King James Bible and talking to me. And he says, he he was a simple message he was giving me. He was very direct, didn't beat around the bush, and and just went for it. He said, you know, um, um, something to think, you know why it's important that that, that you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And and then he told me uh, that I was a sinner uh, that I would not go to heaven if I did not become saved. And that, um, I mean, he, did, he just got down to the nitty gritty, which basically said, you know, either you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and become born again, or the consequences are you will spend eternity in hell when you could spend eternity forever with God in heaven. Now he was not fear mongering. This is this is the point here. He's not. He was not fear mongering, and he was not manipulating me. He was just. He knew he had not that much time, and he just told it like it was because that's his kind of personality. So we're whizzing down the freeway as he's preaching to me from this King James Bible and not holding onto the steering wheel, and he looks at me and says, "Do you want to pull off to the side of the road and invite Jesus Christ into your life? And pray the sinner's prayer." Now, some of you have heard me say this before, but I'll say it again. I'm going in my head. Great. This is, there's a very high possibility, Paul, that you are in a car with a religious axe murder pervert who's going to, after you pull off on the side of the road, he's going to chop your head off um, 
with like an axe and, and bury your body in the bushes after he does God knows what to you. I'm serious. I'm from New York. I'm very paranoid. I mean, we are in the middle of nowhere, and this guy is like, you know, I don't know what he was. So don't ask me why I said yes. I said yes. I'll say the, I'll, we'll pull us out of the road. I'll, I'll say the prayer. Now, again, I wasn't, I wasn't saying this to humor him. I wasn't saying this because I was afraid. It was like I said yes for the same reason I said yes to the initial invitation. I don't know why I said yes, because normally I would have, I would have said, you, you know, I would, have, I would have said, no, I want to keep on going back to the campus. I have no idea why I said yes. The next thing I know, he's leading me in the sinner's prayer, which is very simple. He says, repeat after me, and it went something like this, and I repeated after him. Jesus Christ, and if you're not saved and want to be born again, by the way, if you you join in on this prayer that I'm repeating, uh, by the time you finish it, you will be saved, you will be born again, and you will know you're going into heaven, and you'll not go to hell. It's simple, but it's true. So I'm going to tell you, uh, how the prayer he said and and how I repeated it, but but I meant it, okay? I meant it. I mean, it wasn't some big spiritual thing. I, I, I wasn't doing it to humor him. I meant it. At the, okay, so he said something like, and I repeated after him, and you can repeat after me if you want, because it's just that simple to get into heaven. By the way, getting into heaven and being born again is not complicated. So if people try to make it complex and difficult, forget about it. It's simple, man. It's so simple. You can you're going to hear how simple it is. It's, it's it, it it will it will amaze you how simple it is. If you've been if you want to be saved, and you should want to be saved because if you're not saved, you can't get into heaven. We can explain that the reason for that later. If you want to be saved, then you need to ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins. And you need to ask Jesus to make you born again. And when Jesus Christ answers your prayer and makes you and forgives you of your sins and makes you born again, then you are guaranteed into entrance into the kingdom of heaven for all eternity. That, by the way, this, by the way, is the most important decision you will ever make in your entire life. And I'm not exaggerating it. So this is how he began to pray. I repeated with him, and you can repeat after me if you want to be born again. So he went, Lord Jesus Christ. And I said, Lord Jesus Christ, I come to you now. And I said, I come to you now. And Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. So I said those words, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. But I didn't even know what the word sin meant. Okay, I didn't even know what my sins were. I thought sins were some kind of archaic concept from medieval history. But I said it. I said, Jesus Christ, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And then he said, and Jesus, I ask you to come into my life right now and make me born again. So I, I said, Jesus, I ask you to come into my life right now and make me born again. And then he said something to the effect of, Jesus, I thank you that you have forgiven me of all my sins. I thank you that you have made me born again. I thank you that I'm now saved. And I praise you, Jesus, that you are Lord. And so I said that. I said, Jesus, I thank you. Uh, that you've forgiven me of my sins. I thank you that you've come into my life right now and have made me born again. And I I praise you, Lord, that I'm saved in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I said that. I didn't feel a thing. I didn't feel a thing. But I said it, and I meant it. Don't ask me why I said, said it, because I don't know why I said it. I think I said it because the Spirit of God was working upon my heart and mind And I didn't totally realize it at the time. Just like the Spirit of God could be working on your heart and mind right now, and you may not totally realize it at the time. So that night, uh, I went out, partied with my friends, got drunk, 
like I usually did, and uh, forgot, you know, I forgot about the uh, the thing that happened hitchhiking on the back roads of Missouri and praying the sinner's prayer. So the next morning, these Christians who had been witnessing to me on the campus of the University of, of Missouri banged on my door, rang the doorbell, you know, like really early in the morning, 7 a.m. or something. And they were all smiling, you know, praise Jesus, Paul, praise Jesus. And this is like, you know, it's a little bit too much first thing in the morning, 7 a.m. But they had me walk around the campus with them, which I did basically because I thought the girl in the group was cute. Uh, and so that's why basically I did it. So anyway, we walked around the camp at the campus of the University of Missouri, and um, we went to this place where it's like the center of the university, and this is a giant grassy uh, squares, you know, with these massive uh, Roman columns they called the quadrangles. So I guess there were four of them, and uh, and people would gather and sit and blankets and walk and talk and stuff all, all over this giant grassy area. And we were kind of near the, the Roman columns. And uh, um, this, uh, I was sharing with the, the Christians what happened to me the, the day before. You know, I was going through the, the account of what had happened to me. And this girl who's not too far from us, but she's not part of our group. I don't know who she is. Nobody knows who she is. She's sitting on a blanket. And she gets up and she walks towards us and uh, looks at us and then uh, uh, looks at me. And she says, looking at me in the group, she says, you know, forgive me for interrupting you, but I just happened to be a minister's daughter. And I was sitting here right while I heard you talk because I was in the middle of thinking about whether or not I really believe that that Jesus Christ is who he said he was, that Jesus Christ is Lord, that Jesus Christ is God, and he's the Savior. I was, I was wrestling with this in my mind. Is it really true? And, and, and she was a minister's daughter, she said. And so uh, then she looked, me, looked at me in the eyes directly, and she said to me, point blank, she said, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And all of a sudden, I blurted out in response words that I'd never, ever said before in my entire life. I'd never said these words in my entire life before. I blurted out in response, yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And I meant it, and I don't even know why I said it, but I did, and I looked at her right in the eye. And then when I said it, it was literally as if the sky cracked open and I saw God, not in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense, instantaneously after I said to her, the minister's daughter, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It was as if the sky cracked open and I saw God, not in a, a physical sense, but a spiritual sense. And at that moment, I knew that I knew that I knew that Jesus Christ alone was God, that Jesus Christ was God. There was no other God beside him. I just knew it. See, I had a knowing so deep and so profound. I knew that I knew that I knew that Jesus Christ was Lord at that moment, instantaneously. And I knew that all my new age and mystical experiences like altered states of consciousness and cosmic consciousness and seeing the great white light and astral projection and psychedelic drugs, and all the other stuff, meditative states, I knew that all of those were illusions. So I knew instantaneously that Jesus Christ was the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through him, and that everything else was an illusion. I had a profound knowing. It was like the question was settled. That was it. And it was at that moment I knew, for the first time in my life, instantaneously I knew why I was alive, what my purpose in life was, and what I was doing here on planet Earth. It was all answered to me in, in, in seconds after I said the words, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, because the sky cracked open spiritually, and, and the answers and the truth of who Jesus Christ was and is was so powerful, so instantaneous, so, such a revelation that was so overwhelming 
that had answered all the questions that were haunting me from childhood. And so, I mean, I, I was like transported. I mean, I was totally physically there and, and cognizant of everything going, going around me, but I had a revolutionary, radical experience with Jesus Christ. I knew that I was born again. I knew that I was saved. I knew that I was not going to go to hell. And I knew that there was a heaven. And I knew that there was powers of darkness and, and counterfeit uh, demonic type beings. And I knew Jesus Christ was the Savior and that Jesus Christ had saved me. And I was exhilarated beyond belief and, and literally for months it was like I was flying as high as a kite. I mean, it was so intense that when I would go to sleep at night and I would just like let my legs uh, go down the sheets, I would just like, the, the joy that was just like, the joy that was in me was just so, it was like, there's no words to describe it, this intense, this super intense, overwhelming joy it was like being high, but it was like pure and wondrous. And it was a relationship with Jesus where he was talking to me and communicating to me, not in an audible voice. And then uh, this went on for months. And But the problem was that, that I didn't find a church. I didn't find a place to grow in the Lord, uh, be discipled, read the word, be accountable. I didn't find that place. So even though I was born again, uh, I forgot how many months afterwards, I slowly began to go astray again because there was no uh, spiritual roots. There was no foundation in my life. I wasn't uh, disciplined in reading the Word of God. And so, but the experience didn't go away. I knew I was saved. But now problems began to arise because I would go out and attempt to party like I used to do with my friends on the campus. And the problem was, though, that all of a sudden, well, two things happened. First of all, I would start getting, you know, tipsy and drunk in a bar, hanging out with my friends. And the next thing I knew, I was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ constantly at every bar or party I went to, even if I was high or partially drunk. So, the, <laughs> you know, the Holy Spirit was in me. The problem is my carnality was still totally there. And then, um, as I was at these parties, um, I would attempt to sin. But the problem was, if I sinned or attempted to sin, all of a sudden I had this completely new uh, feeling going on in my life, which was I felt guilty. I never felt guilty about the kinds of things I was doing before, but now I felt guilty about doing all these things at these parties. And what it really was, it was the Holy Spirit convicting me of sin and the Holy Spirit calling me back to Jesus, to holiness and to repentance. But, but, but you know, I wanted to sin. This was a conflict in me. So what happened was that um, um, I would drink... E far more heavily than I used to because I was trying to drown out the voice of my conscience and drown out the voice of the Holy Spirit so I could, so I could completely rebel and sin. And so then I would take even more drugs and more booze to knock out that voice, see, which is a very, very bad thing to do because, because things really got bad for me uh, because, because I was in rebellion from God. God was patient. He kept calling me and calling me back to himself but I was stiff-necked, and I determined to rebel. And uh, he allowed me to be broken, uh, not because he's sadistic, but but it was like you know when I was sinning, there was all, and and not and I had not yet accepted Jesus Christ. There was almost like a supernatural demonic blessing on my life. If if you know, it's the only way I can think of it, because it, it was like. As long as I was serving the devil, I mean, I wasn't like consciously serving the devil. I wasn't saying things like, Satan, I worship you, or Satan, I serve for you. I never, I never would have done that. But the net effect was, if you're rejecting Christ and rebelling from Christ, the net effect is, whether you say it or not, you are, whether you realize it, serving the devil. 
So, so the devil was like happy with me as long as I was rebelling because I was getting a lot of other people to rebel. And so, uh, but then God like cursed that and he, he began to deal with me and, but, and lovingly called me back to himself, but I resisted all that. So he allowed me to be broken to get my attention. And then, um, I decide. I, I I realize. You know, I'm at a deep fork in the road. I've accepted Christ. I know I'm born again, but here I am trying to act like I'm not born again and continue to sin. This is not going to work because there's a new formula at work in my life, which is I can't enjoy sin anymore. I'm trying my hardest to enjoy sin, but I can't really enjoy it because I have the Holy Spirit inside me. So, um, after a number of months or whatever, the, 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 the campus, uh, the year, the college year ends, I go back to New York City, and uh, I end up at a place, uh, uh, a ministry called the Lambs Club. But prior to that, I, I, I tried to find uh, a Bible-believing church that I could go to, and I did attend a Bible-believing church in uh, the campus of the University of Missouri. It was called Calvary uh, uh, Baptist something or other church, Calvary Baptist Church of Columbia or something. And and that's all I could remember. So when I looked at the yellow pages in the phone book of Manhattan, I had no idea how to find a born-again church or a Bible-believing church. So I, I my fingers were going down the page, and I saw the words Calvary Baptist Church in Manhattan. So I said, well, gee, that sounds like exactly like the Bible-believing church I had went to. So I called up, made an appointment, and met one of the pastors uh, who prayed for me. And then I w- began attending church there, listening to the messages, which were Bible-based, strong Bible teaching back then. Back then, back then, a lot of the churches that you would just visit that were Christian churches were Bible-based and emphasized salvation and Jesus. They weren't what they are now. And so this guy from England, uh, who was a famous Bible teacher, I forgot what his name was, but he was preaching a sermon. And I was, be- I was being convicted by the Holy Spirit as he preached because he was, he was telling the people gathered, such as myself, that, you know, it's not just enough for you to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and, and be born again. He said, that will get you into heaven, but you really will not be able to fulfill God's plan for your life and not be able to see God move in your life unless you come to the place where you're willing to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Master, not just your Savior. So I was convicted by the Holy Spirit, and I went forward to pray, as others did when he gave the altar call. And kneeling at the uh, front of the altar at uh, Calvary Baptist Church in Manhattan, which was roughly across the street from the Russian Tea Room, a famous place, I knelt in prayer and I invited Jesus Christ to be my Lord and my Master as well as my Savior. And I prayed it and I meant it. And so it's not that doesn't mean that every second of my life since I invited. Jesus Christ to be my Lord, that doesn't mean every second of my life I've lived in perfect holiness and never have sinned or uh, totally obeyed him as my Lord every moment of my life. No, that's not true. But that's my intention. And so by the grace of God, the Lord has kept me on course with that. So I can say Jesus Christ is still my Lord. And uh but I have to pray. I have to abide in him and allow him to abide in me and renew my mind with the word of God and, and, and that kind of thing. And I realized that God has a plan for my life, which answered my original question. Why was I alive? What is my purpose in life? And you can't find the answer to that unless you know God, because only God knows why he created you. And only God ultimately knows why, what, your plan is supposed to be, what your purpose in life is supposed to be. You know, God chose you before the beginning of the world, before the foundation of the world, 
to be here for such a time as this, which means that God knew you before the beginning of the world. He knew you before the world was created. And he chose specifically for you to be here in this time zone, in this nation or whatever nation you're listening in. God specifically planned and designed for you to be here wherever you are at this exact moment. And along with that, God has a plan for your life that he wants it to unfold. And that's why he created you before the foundation of the world, to fulfill his plan. And you can only find maximum maximum fulfillment, maximum peace, maximum joy, maximum satisfaction. You can only know that to the degree you're following God's ultimate plan for your life. Now, you know, you can go to this seminar and that seminar regarding what career you should have. You can attend this college or that school or this university or whatever and take all these uh, aptitude tests and psychological tests or whatever <clears throat> to determine your gifts and talents and abilities. But ultimately, I'm not saying that those things can't be useful. It's, it's nice to know what your talents are or what you're, you're not talented in. <clears throat> uh, because that can save you a lot of heartache and pain. If you're trying to be something you weren't created to be, okay, it can be very difficult and you'll waste a lot of time. So the thing is, though, the only person who's intelligent enough to know what your real and true purpose in life is, is God. Because God, the infinite personal living God of the universe, is the one that created you. So only he knows really how you're made and what you're really all about because he put it in you. He put it in your DNA before you were born. And so God has a specific plan for you. Now, you can choose to, by faith, ask God to reveal his plan for you, trusting in the fact that God's mind is infinite. God is omniscient. God is all-knowing. God knows the end from the beginning. God knows the end from the beginning. So if you seek his face, which you should do, he will reveal his plan for you. And in that plan, his plan is the only place you'll find total fulfillment. Now, you can try to figure out what your plan is with your own human mind, but the problem is your human mind is finite, it's small, it's limited. It doesn't have all the facts, it doesn't have all the knowledge, and you didn't create yourself, God did. So your human mind in and of itself doesn't really, really know what your plan is. So it makes it very difficult to fulfill the true plan for which you were created um, with a small, finite mind, which is what most people do. Now, I want to make a, a distinction here, though, that's, that's important. I'm not saying for a moment that, <clears throat> that in your own finite human mind, you won't have uh, ideas come forth, images come forth, uh, thoughts come forth, that, that begin to blossom in your inner being, giving you clues or giving you light as to uh, what your plan is or what you're gifted at. It may come in the form of, of you uh, seeing yourself doing this or you seeing yourself doing that. I'm not talking about some visualization exercise. I'm just talking about when you're going about life and you're daydreaming and you're not even aware that you're daydreaming or you're talking or you see something and all of a sudden an impression comes to your mind, an image comes to your mind, a thought comes to your head, somebody says something, or you see something, and it, begin, it begins, you may not even recognize it at the time, but it begins to form a picture or a concept or an idea of what you were created to be and what your talents are and what your gifting is and what you should be in the future. You, it's, it's, this is like semi-conscious. You may not be aware of it. And there's nothing wrong with that because God uses that. God uses that. It can be one of a number of powerful tools to discover what your plan is. But unless you connect those ideas, those images, those thoughts, like you see somebody doing a career and you go, 
man, that's what I want to do with my life. Maybe you'll change your mind. No, I don't want to do that. I'll do this. That's fine. You can change your mind. You're not locked into it. But the point is, the reason you go, man, that's what I'd like to do with my life is because that's the Holy Spirit working on you and trying to to kind of give you your plan. Now, um, this is an important process. Because you'll begin to subconsciously visualize or picture yourself. Again, I'm not talking about Eastern mystical um, um, programs. So the other thing is, though, the Bible says, and listen very carefully to this scripture, because it'll give you an enormous amount of understanding about how to discover your plan or your purpose or your destiny. The Word of God says, for the Spirit of the Lord is, is excuse me, sorry, I got it backwards. The Word of God says, for the Spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. I'll say it again. For the Spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. For the Spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. What does that mean? It means that your human spirit, your human spirit that makes you you, where where you have these imaginings of of what you're supposed to do or what you believe you're supposed to do, or you have these glimmers of light or images, or you see things and say, gee, that's that's what I believe I'm supposed to do, or that's what I want to do with my life, or these are my talents, that that's good. See, what 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 what's happening there is a process, and you have to understand the process. In your human stirrings in your human images and imaginations and pictures and ideas and thoughts. It's like a tapestry, which is like a, well, let's not call it a tapestry. Let's call it a blank canvas, like a painting that hasn't been painted yet. It's just blank. <clears throat> but as you think, as you see things that that speak to you in life, like, gee, I, I can do that. I, I'd like to do that. That's what I want to do in my life or, you know, Gee, I'd love to do that. Or I feel I feel that's what my real talent is, and I don't feel like my talent is that. As as those as, as that thought pro- process develops, what you're doing is is you're beginning to paint abstractly on a canvas abstract images that don't have a coherent um, um, clarity to to what the forms you're painting haven't haven't uh, coalesced into a a form that is immediately recognizable. Like, it's, it's abstract. You don't realize that you're pa- painting really an apple tree because you've just begun. You don't realize that you're painting a sunset with the water because you've just begun. Do you understand? So what that is, that's a process. and You've got to recognize what the process is. That's the spirit of a man is the candle of the Lord. The Holy Spirit illuminates the Holy Spirit of God, which is the third person of the Trinity, illuminates our human spirit and our inner man or inner woman and drives or inspires these thoughts, these ideas and images. What this can be, and you have to be discerning, what this can be is the Lord communicating to you on a deep level what your life is supposed to be about without, um, through your own spirit. So it's not like you know it's God speaking. You think it's your own imagination. You think it's your own thoughts, but you don't understand that it's a process where the Lord is really energizing your own thoughts, your own imaginations, your own ideas. You, You get the picture? So what you have to be careful about, first of all, you, you don't, not dream. You don't suppress the creative process. God uses it. Remember, God is a creator, capital C. But on a note of caution is you don't want to suppress the dreams, the ideas, and the images that God is forming in you. But on the other hand, you want to discern that it is the Holy Spirit that's energizing these thoughts and these ideas over time. And the way you you know or, or you can better ensure 
that you're that it's the Holy Spirit, that's God that's <clears throat> giving you clarity to what your life is supposed to be about, or whatever the issue is, is that number one, you have to be born again. I'll say that again. You can't expect to receive God's supernatural guidance for your life. You can't expect to unlock God's supernatural plan for your life unless you have repented of your sins and invited Jesus Christ into your life to make you born again. Why? Why, why is that an essential prerequisite? It's essential because otherwise... The reality is that every single one of us is born with a fallen human nature. This occurred after Adam and Eve rejected the word of God and the fall of man occurred and that sin activated the law of sin and death. So every one of us are born with a fallen human nature. We, have a, we, have, we are naturally bent towards sin and rebellion. We are naturally antagonistic to the things of God and we... We, we are naturally, because of our birth sinful nature, in rebellion from God. As such, when we're born of the flesh, we, we have a human spirit that can guide us. But remember, the human spirit can be very intelligent and perceptive, but unless the human spirit is regenerated or born again by the Spirit of God, which can only happen when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord in a prayer by faith, and you invite Jesus Christ into your life and you're born again, it is at that moment the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your heart and mind, and you become a new creature in Christ Jesus. And then Christ himself dwells in you. The Holy Spirit himself dwells in you. And then the Holy Spirit, not, not your fallen human spirit, the Holy Spirit regenerates your your fallen dead human spirit and makes your fallen dead human spirit become born again uh, it becomes alive in the spirit of god now when that happens the light of god the wisdom of god the intelligence of god the plan of god can then be sent into your inner man or woman and it can communicate unhindered to your human spirit so you're not you're no longer blocked off from the light of god and his plan for your life the curtains have been opened and the lord because you've repented of your sin and you're born again the lord is able to communicate to you deep calleth unto deep and you may not be aware of it on an intellectual level but your spirit your human spirit is communing it's it's in a relationship to the Spirit of God, and among numerous other things that are happening, there's a transference by God, who's the infinite personal living God of the universe, to you, and God is, in a sense, impregnating you with all kinds of ideas and imaginations and plans and purposes. And then what you've done by praying the sinner's prayer by faith is you've released the power of God, the wisdom of God, and the Spirit of God to activate your life. Because you can't activate your life unless you're born again. That doesn't mean you can't have a life or a career unless you're born again. But you will never, ever become the real person you were created to be. You will never fulfill the real destiny you were created to fulfill. And you will never um, um, do the things you were called to do unless you are born again and ultimately led by the Spirit of God. On top of that, as you begin to renew your mind with the Word of God, that's, that's uh, the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. When you renew your mind with the Word of God, remember, the Word of God <clears throat> is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder you know, cutting into the depths of the inner man or woman, penetrating the depth of your biological, physiological, psychological being. The Word of God goes right into it, and, and it is creative, and it brings life to pass on, on all kinds of levels, including your destiny, your relationships, your career, everything. See, that's what happens. It's powerful. It's revolutionary. But the only way you can access it 
there's no other way you can access this, is the only way you can access this is by putting your faith in Christ and receiving Jesus into your life, asking him to make you born again. And then when Christ, by your prayer of faith, regenerates or makes alive and makes you born again, pow, the new man or new woman comes alive immediately. And it's like all of the, think of like a trillion bits of information coming from all kinds of networks, neural networks, spiritual networks, uh, just pouring into you. And God is, is, is just lighting you up in your inner man or woman with the knowledge of God, the purposes of God, the plans of God. It's mind-blowing, man. I mean, it's totally mind-blowing. And it's good. And that's how you get released. That's how you find your destiny. That's what I was looking for when I was a child. That's what I was desperately looking for. And then I end up going to this PS69 grammar school in Jackson Heights, Queens, first grade, and I feel like I'm in either a prison or an insane asylum because to ask the most natural question a child could ask, which is, why am I alive? What is my purpose in life? Is there a God? These are natural questions. And to have them suppressed by nonverbal communication, oh, we don't talk about that, that's like, let me tell you what it's like. It's like having a giant pillow stuck on your face and somebody suffocating you. That's what it's like. Okay, let's pause for a, for a minute. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. And you can, this, this uh, program will help a lot of people. It will set a lot of people free. But in order for that to happen, it requires that you be willing to listen to what the Lord is saying to you and send a link of this program on the various social media we have available to somebody that you know needs to hear it. And you can do that by going to paulmaguire.us. That's paulmaguire.us. And there's a banner for the Paul McGuire Report and a whole uh, list of the social media apps where you can uh, uh, listen to this program on. You know, this message that I'm sharing with you today contains powerful truth. And as you heard, truth that that is not available in the school systems and in the media and and places like that. And it's not available in many churches. You know that and I know that. So the only way that people can hear this kind of truth that will totally change their lives, because my life was not totally changed, by the way, until somebody communicated to me the truth. And I shared with you a series of miraculous events as to how that happened. But unless that happened, I'd be still walking around wondering what my purpose in life is and, and, and not even knowing God. I'd be walking around in the total darkness. How sad. The only reason I'm not is because people took their time, listened to the Lord, obeyed the Lord, and communicated with me. Because I was a hard sell, Okay. I was not like like open to this message. So there are people all over the world, and you know some of them, that have to have this message, the truth of the gospel, in a way they can relate to, because if they don't, they're going to perish. And ultimately, all of us are confronted with a choice of whether or not we will spend eternity in heaven with God in our new glorified bodies. But that can only happen by accepting Christ as our Lord and Savior. And the only way a person can accept Christ as their Lord and Savior is if, if somebody uh, communicates to them the gospel in a way that they understand and in a way that they relate to. That's what bringing in the last day's soul harvest is all about. So that's the burden in my heart. What happened to me hitchhiking on the back roads of Missouri over 40 years ago in the, in, in field of dreams kind of experience. That changed the course of my life forever. The reason that I'm doing what I'm doing right now at this moment has to do with that radical change that occurred on the back roads of Missouri hitchhiking. That decision, those divine encounters changed my life forever. Many of you can share similar experiences, but you know what? There are millions of people on planet Earth, millions upon millions upon millions of people 
who have not heard the message that we're talking about. And the only way they will hear it is if somebody presents it to them in a manner they can relate to. And then, if that message is prayed over and the anointing of the Holy Spirit is upon it, and it's put together in a way that they can relate to, then many, many people can be set free from the spiritual darkness, and they can come to salvation in Jesus Christ. That is the burden on my heart. That's the mission among numerous missions that the Lord has given me. So how do you do that? Well, not everybody drives around in the cornfields. But we have television today. We have social media. We have laptops. We have cell phones. We have conferences. We have films. We have DVDs. We have books. We have such a We're so blessed in America to have such a wide spectrum of communications that are relatively affordable, relatively affordable. And so God has instructed me that he wants to reach the people out there that aren't being reached. It's a matter of life or death. And so the Lord has put it on my heart to develop and fully launch our television ministry in order to produce programs that will communicate uniquely and differently in a way that people can relate to and in a way that produces results so that people will actually come to the Lord versus just hearing a lot of religious babble. But we've got to launch these television programs, and that requires basic things like the right broadcast equipment, the right uh, production team, the right number of broadcast cameras, the right numbers of lighting, the right amount of soundproofing. We have begun. We have begun, but there's a lot more to do because it, 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 just one person can't do it by themselves. And the equipment requires professional help because you're, you're moving into a much larger arena. So we're very close to launching that. And that means live streaming the Bible teaching that I give from Paradise Mountain Church. That means... Uh, televising this radio program um, and broadcasting it not only on Christian networks, but social media networks like Facebook and YouTube. And so you can watch the Paul McGuire Report if you choose to or or other programs um, on your cell phone or your laptop. And then I have an incredible burden because, you know, people don't have big attention spans. And so if you're going to communicate stuff to people, it can be enhanced. It can be more effective if you're using visuals and videos and charts so they can, so like at a glance, they can get, they can connect the dots at a glance. And that's what we are all about. But I'm telling you, I have to raise the additional funding. I've shared this with you a lot. We've come a long way. There's further that we have to go. Um, the equipment. The crew, the lighting, the uplink technology, the soundproofing. I mean, it's, it's really endless. And that's just to produce a high quality, a very high quality, basic production. But it's acceptable and it, it, it hits the target. As such, we also have to enhance our social media, expand the radio outreach, expand and amplify every one of our outreaches, continue the Paradise Mountain Church meetings, and televise the teaching, and maybe, if we can, Lord willing, televise interaction, and provide other programming with with videos, uh, you know, like little documentary videos and stuff that powerfully communicate truth and answer people's questions. So I'm at, that's a spiritual battle, by the way. Because in doing what I just described, we are coming against the principalities and powers and the dark unseen forces of wickedness in heavenly places. You and I both know that there is a Lucifer. I didn't used to believe that. I used to think Lucifer was was something made up and that the devil was really just a symbol for human ignorance. Well, I learned after I got saved that the devil is a real being. And there are real fallen angels beneath him, and people literally choose to serve the devil. And so whenever you're trying to set people free, that the devil is holding captive. And how does the devil hold people captive? He holds them captive through ideas, through imaginations, through thoughts, through uh, images. 
That's why I was talking about all that. That's how the devil holds people captive. The battle for the mind and soul. And so he dominates and controls people by controlling the images, the, the uh, pictures, the sounds, the messages, the symbols, uh, the content uh, that's going on in their minds. And he's using technolo uh, technological weaponry like film, television, music, radio, social media, etc., etc. So how do you win that battle? You have to go on the same battlefield. What's the battlefield called? It's the battlefield of the mind, but it's also the battlefield of the spirit, and it's the battlefield of media or the battlefield of communication because the essential war is the war for the hearts and minds for, of mankind. That's what's going on. So if we're going to fulfill what God has called us to do, which is change the direction of a nation, uh, preach the gospel to all nations, um, occupy the land until he comes, um, win, uh, in, bring in a last day soul harvest, we have to penetrate and invade the battlefields. And that's why it's not like, should we do it or not do it? No, we have to. We have to use spiritual weapons, but use the technology better than he does and do it for less money. Because the devil wastes a lot of money because he steals his money. So we can, we can conquer, we can overturn what the devil has implanted in people's minds and hearts in order to keep them bound in spiritual captivity. We can, we can set them free by being more imaginative. But why shouldn't we be more imaginative? Our God is the Creator, capital C, and utilizing television and uh, the radio and social media and books and DVDs at a higher level of creativity, anointing, and effectiveness. But to do that, we have to move forward aggressively by faith, knowing in our hearts that we can take the land um, and by your help. It's a spiritual war for first. That means we don't win at all unless we literally have a law-abiding and peaceful army of spiritual intercessors, people who will fast, pray, engage in spiritual warfare for myself, my family, and this ministry, and everything associated with it. If you're listening and you're not in, engaged in that kind of spiritual warfare on a regular basis, you know, there's a the time of grace where the Lord may be growing you, and God is patient. But at a certain point, if, if you're listening, but you're not engaged spiritually, um, you're, you're missing an important part of your calling. Because none of our callings are independent of one another. I've spent my entire life making other people's callings happen. The vast majority of my life was spent in ministry, but ministering to, to empower uh, the person God called to minister. I could name names. You would know some of them. Serving that ministry. That was essential because I couldn't do the ministry I'm doing unless I was developed by serving and volunteering for other ministries. That's how you, you learn. So at a certain point in your, in your walk with the Lord, you have to make that you have to be willing to accept that, that joyous assignment of serving, even if you don't get any credit. Most of the stuff I've done in my life, I didn't get any credit for. And you know what? I don't even care about credit because you know what? You can't take credit with you to heaven. I'll be, I'll be really brutal. The Lord kind of smacked me in the face with a number of experiences. The credit that we want down here on earth None of it goes to heaven. It gets burned up like wood, hay, and stubble. The only thing that goes with us into heaven is souls we've saved, things we've done for God out of a pure heart. Those are the treasures that go with us into heaven. All the other stuff, nobody's going to remember. So, <laughs> you know, you're crazy if you're, you know, these people who want to build a monument to themselves. Well, you know, good luck, because that monument is not going to exist, nor will anybody even remember it was built in heaven. It's meaningless. So accept the challenge, accept the call of the Holy Spirit. You're being called now, 
by the Holy Spirit to pray, to be a spiritual warfare, and to be disciplined and to be committed about it on a regular basis. God is calling you now. You simply pray a prayer of um, obedience where you ask the Lord, you, you surrender your, your life to the Lord, you ask, you tell God you want to obey the call he's giving you, and then he gives you the power to, to, to fulfill it and to be obedient. We need people to stand by us with their donations and their financial gifts. And I thank God for each and every one of you that have been faithful in that, and for those of you who have prayed, and those of you that help us by simply spreading the message. And I would say the same thing to you in the area of making donations or contributions. You ask God, and the Lord is speaking to numbers of you right now. I'm not manipulating you. I can sense the, the move of the Spirit of God. So I don't, I don't have to manipulate, because if I manipulated, I would just get in, what, get in the way of the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is calling numerous people to take on the divine assignment seriously of being a co-laborer with this ministry through your financial contributions and donations to help us launch the television ministry and the other things that I described. And you simply obey the Lord, whatever he tells you to do, and you're faithful and you're committed to that. By the way, that's spiritual warfare. And you give according to how God has blessed you. So if your budget allows for $15 or $25, God's going to reward you because you're being faithful with what you have. If God has blessed you at a far higher level, then you give accordingly. Or if you expect blessings uh, coming in the future, then give accordingly. The Lord knows each one of our situations, and he's totally fair, and he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him and serve him. But you can't serve him, obviously, until you seek him first. So together we can make an impact. You know, there's a massive spiritual warfare going on over America right now. And I just want to exhort you, as your brother in Christ, please do not come to premature conclusions as to what the outcome will be. Because you heard somebody here, or you heard somebody there, and therefore you, you kind of give in to a backdoor fatalism that it can only be this way because, you know, this person said that or this prophet said that or whatever. No, it's not like that. God works in partnership with his people. Before God does something, he, he works in partnership with his people. God moves when his people ask him to do or pray or engage in spiritual warfare or become disciplined and, and utilize the communications uh, systems that he's given us. Look at the amount of hell and the demonic that is released through Facebook and social media and television and film. An enormous amount. But th those same mediums like TV and film and radio and social media, they can be used for enormous good also. So we can turn the tide of the spiritual battle. You don't know what the outcome is. Neither do I. I'm not God. I don't have an infinite brain, neither do you. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to, and really it's a subtle form of pride, I'm not going to assume that I know all the answers because I heard so-and-so say this, or so I read this from so-and-so. And by the way, when you make up all the lists of so-and-so who said this and so-and-so who said that, they all contradict each other. So the bottom line is, we, we may believe, including myself, that this is what the Lord may do, and I never say conclusively what the Lord will do. I point in the direction that I feel the Lord is leading me to point in. But I can't draw up a conclusion. That would be like foolishness as well as prideful because I'm not God. He's sovereign. You know, like, like these people who said, well, it's too late for America. The world's going bad. America's evil. God's going to judge it. We're, we're going to be destroyed by the wrath of God. Well, we may be at some point in time. The question is, is that time now? And you better be sure before you throw away your child's future, your family's future, your friend's future, and your own future on a premature, on a premature conclusion based on an erroneous analysis. No, I'm serious about this. Because you don't know the outcome. You don't know what God has planned. 
our job, listen really carefully. This is really important. This is the most important thing. Well, it's not the most important thing, but it's very important. Our job is to be faithful until he comes. Our job is to be about our father's business until he comes. That's what the Bible says. Parable of the talents. Our job is to occupy the land until he comes. Our job is to preach the gospel until he comes. That requires praying to God, seeking God, being faithful with what God has given us in terms of talents, abilities, time, finances, resources, and other such things. To be faithful until he comes, to occupy until he comes. Not to, to falsely conclude that this is it, it's too late, and, you know, throw, squander, because that's what it is, squandering everything the Lord has deposited in your life or is developed in your life for X amount of decades. You can't buy into these lies that this and that or whatever. See, our job is, is, to, is to be faithful, to, 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 to obey what God has called us to do, to commit ourselves to do what God has called us to do, and to do what God has called us to do, without, without looking at or trying to conclude what the outcome is going to be. We're, we are obedient and diligent and busy about our Father's business. And that's what should be occupying our attention. That's the only way we can be faithful. Now, if the Lord changes his game plan, he doesn't change his game plan. He knows what his game plan is. But we may think he's changing his game plan. If things unexpected happen, if, if timetables we, we have thought were true are no longer true, if there are changes that happen, good or bad, that we didn't expect, our job is to be faithful. Our job is not to be so caught up in the outcome that we are paralyzed from being the people that God created us to be. When uh, I was in the film business and my wife was an, an actress, she had a famous acting coach who would tell actors, because it's a, this is a transferable concept. She would tell actors, I mean, not she, the famous acting coach would tell actors who were, you know, frustrated because their career was not going in the right direction or um, other such things, or, or they didn't feel like they were getting better as actors. He would, he would say to them, just keep sweeping the alley. Just keep sweeping the alley. And the idea was, is that an actor or actress was to be faithful and just to keep sweeping the alley, which kind of brings back images of a, a New York City street scene where, where you're busy sweeping the alley of all the garbage and stuff. And, and, and in older times in New York, people would open their windows. You know, you've seen these old movies. And they'd holler at you and shout at you and make fun of you if you did stuff like that. I'm talking about like in the 40s and 30s. Okay, so the idea was that you ignored people making fun of you and calling you names and booing you and everything else. And your job is to, is to sweep the alley and, and keep it clean. So you just keep sweeping the alley. And what the coach was trying to teach was that if, and he wasn't a Christian, he, what he was trying to teach was that your job is to do what you're supposed to do. So just keep at it, keep at it, be faithful, be diligent, be committed to keep at it and keep at it keeping your eyes on what you're supposed to do, and don't worry about this other stuff that, that's out of your control. And the undergirding principle was, is that if you're willing to commit to doing that, sweeping the alley, um, that remarkably, the, the good things, the blessings, and other such things seem to happen. But it might take a decade or years, or whatever. Do you understand? The key is that you're faithful. So in a sense, he was teaching the principle of being faithful and not being all caught up and, and distracted by what you think is going to happen. See, actors are, are, are like anybody else. They're, they're, they're terrified that their careers will never take off. They're, they're terrified that if their careers have taken off, that their careers will bomb out. There's a high degree of anxiety because of the nature of the business. So, so, you know, the anxiety level of many actors, well, gee, will I ever get that first part? Will I ever get uh, a job in a movie or a TV show? Or am I just going to be a waiter or a waitress for the rest of my life? Huge anxiety. And he was telling them, just keep sweeping the alley. In other words, 
quit getting caught up in all that stuff. Just, you know, keep rehearsing, going to auditions, you know, make yourself look physically proper for whatever role you're going for. You know, keep up with your training, be stay focused, keep sweeping the alley. So that's like, uh, that can be analogous to a Christian being faithful to Jesus Christ and not being distracted by everything else, but to do exactly what Jesus said. And Jesus was very, very specific about it. He said, he said, occupy the land until I come. Don't get caught up on whether or not America is going to fall or not, or if America is going to have a rebound. Don't get all caught up in uh, whether or not you think there's going to be a civil war or not a civil war. Well, you know, quit getting off on tangents. It doesn't mean you're not supposed to have an awareness of these other things, but you, if you're going to have an awareness of these other things, you better have discernment and you better understand how to perceive the difference between false information and correct information. I get emails all the time. I get messages sent to me. I get hear these reports and these articles that of these people that supposedly have all these credentials and, and sometimes I know that the credentials aren't true because I happen to be part of whatever they're claiming to be part of and they weren't there. And the thing is that um, they, they, they spell these, these, these fantastic horror stories about what's going to happen. And um, usually they're wrong. Most of the time they're wrong. Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. So all the people that get swept into this hysteria are absolutely useless to, uh, for the Lord. Because they're, getting, they're allowing themselves to be distracted. We're supposed to, Jesus is Lord, by the way. Always. And we're to pray. Always. And um, we are to be faithful about our Father's business. Do, do business until I come. Occupy the land until I come. Go into all the world and make disciples. Um, go into all the world and win souls. Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. They we're about our Father's business. That's the purpose of this ministry. That's why we need prayer warriors and people that will donate. There is a direct connection Again, you need to really uh, understand what I'm saying and not assume uh, Ill, Ill, in, Ill intent on my part. There is a direct connection between our willingness to invest our talents, resources, and abilities, and prayers, and action into the kingdom of God and the blessing and the protection and the anointing that comes when we're trying to do the things that we believe that God has called us individually to do. You know, what it comes down to is those of us that are faithful uh, with our father's business, father's business find ourselves being blessed in our businesses, our needs, our wants, our need for protection, guidance, etc. There's, there's a law of reciprocity. A lot of people want to say it's not the case? Well, fine, you can say it's not the case. That's the equivalent of never watering. That's like planting a whole bunch of uh, wonderful flowers in a garden and then deciding uh, you're never going to water the flowers. Uh, you'll only wait for you know the natural rain to water them. Well, that's great if it's raining a lot, but if it's not raining a lot, guess what? All your flowers are going to die. So you got to be taking care of your garden or it's not going to bloom. So I hope this has helped. We need to spread this message to millions of people that need to hear it. And we cannot surrender to fear or anxiety or depression or weariness. We need to rely on the Lord to be filled with his Holy Spirit. And remember, with God, all things are possible. I'm Paul McGuire. Help spread this message far and wide. And you can go to paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. We have a whole bunch of books at uh, discounts right now. We have DVD series teachings. We have uh, an announcement of the next Paradise Mountain Church meeting coming up. Uh, conferences that I'll be speaking, up, speaking at, such as the Red River Bible Prophecy Conference in Moorhead, Minnesota, coming up at the end of March. Um, and then we have... Uh, thousands of pages of articles 
and uh, lots of stuff that will help you. And uh, God bless you. Keep the faith. Your brother in Christ, Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. Oh, one other thing. When you go to paulmcguire.us, make sure you like join the YouTube channel. I, I never mentioned that, and I should. Join the YouTube channel. If, if uh, Join the Facebook channel. Facebook isn't a channel. It's, it's social media, but join it anyway. Join the Twitter uh, thing. I do send out Twitters. I'm laughing at that because uh, for obvious reasons. And then join our other social media and help spread the word. But plug into the YouTube channel and get messages and sign up for the e-blasts and spread the word. God bless you. I'm Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us.